Okay, so yesterday we started looking at a different way of implementing the pull-up network for a MOS type implementation for a implementation of a logic gate using MOS transistors, right? So what we saw was one example that we could use for something like this. We would put a resistance as the pull-up and use an NMOS transistor to act as the switch. Okay? So effectively the way that this works is when di equal to 0, the NMOS is off and vo is equal to VDD. When di is equal to VDD, the NMOS is on and VO we said becomes effectively some kind of Rn by Rn plus R times VDD. Okay? That's a rough approximation. We can get a slightly more accurate estimate in general by doing the calculations a bit more carefully. Right? So let's take a closer look at what the VTC, the voltage transfer characteristic for this would look like. Right. So, this is VO, this is VI. What we have is the same kind of behavior. When VI is 0, the output is equal to VDD. Okay. When VI crosses this point over here, which is VT of the NMOS transistor, from that point onwards, current can flow through the NMOS transistor. Right. And what we find is now it is a competition between the NMOS and the resistance as to which one is going to pull the output voltage lower. Right? Initially the NMOS even though it has started conducting the VGS across it is just slightly more than VT. Right? It is not really sufficient to sustain a large current flow. Okay? Even though the VDS which is VO is fairly large the VGS minus VT is very small so the channel gets pinched off not much current can flow through. Okay. which is why it effectively acts sort of like a high resistance in that region right? and the net result is that the voltage still remains closer to VDD than to ground but that changes pretty rapidly more rapidly than in the case of the CMOS inverter so you will see that it very rapidly starts dropping away okay. but after some time we essentially get to the point where the NMOS is now fully on VGS minus VT is much greater than VDS or VDSAT Right? we have gone into velocity saturation the VDS starts dropping so at some point once VDS goes sufficiently low you go into the linear region okay? and once you go into the linear region essentially you find that once again the current that can flow through the NMOS is limited right? at some point you end up in a situation where whatever current is flowing that v, VDD minus VO divided by R balances out the current through the linear region and you just get a constant sort of asymptotic response right so it sort of flattens out over here so this is a case where what you will find is even if you make the VI higher and higher right the VO will never go to zero because both the resistance and the PMOS are going uh, and the NMOS are going to be conducting and you will end up with a final output voltage which is somewhere in between the two Okay. So, this is going to be your VOL. Okay. Remember how we defined VOL and VOH and VIL and VIH for the case of the CMOS uh, inverter. Right? Effectively, what we said at that point was the VIL is going to be that point at which you know the slope crosses minus 1, right? which effectively means that any input voltage higher than that is no longer considered as a logic 0. Similarly, on the other side, we said any input voltage lower than VIH will not be considered as a logic high. And in between the VIL to VIH range, you will have some kind of a region of uncertainty where you cannot say whether the input is high or low. Okay? So, that was the definition of VIL and VIH. Right? The corresponding output voltages were the VOH and VOL. Right? 
Now, to simplify things, what we can say is rather than worrying about the exact point at which the slope becomes minus 1 and so on, right? We will just consider what is the highest possible output voltage, what is the lowest possible output voltage and treat them as VOH and VOL. Okay, this is an approximation, right? Which is made just to make life easier for us in terms of the calculations, but is close enough to the final result. Okay. If I say that, if I define my VOH and VOL as the actual output height, the voltage that will be seen as an output height when the input is low and the VOL as the voltage that will be seen as output when the input is made high, what would you say the values are from here? What is VOH? VVD. Okay. Remember that this is an approximation we are making. Ideally, you should be looking for that point of slope equal to minus 1 and finding the VOH from there. But this is close enough. Okay. VOL, on the other hand, we will actually have to do some computation for it. Okay. But before I start doing the computation, what I want to understand is, what would be an acceptable value for VOL? What would you consider as an acceptable value for VOL? For, you know, the 180 nanometer process and everything else, given all the other numbers that we have been looking at so far, right, you know what VDD is, you know what VT is, based on all of that, what would you consider an acceptable value for VOL? Or what would you consider is not an acceptable value for VOL? So, what about threshold voltage? Should it be higher or lower than the threshold? Right? So, his suggestion is VOL has to be lower than the VTN. Why? Right? Think about the simplest case that you might implement over here. One inverter driving another inverter. Okay? What happens if I have high at the first stage, I want to see low at the second stage and high at the third stage. Right? Now, what we are saying is, Supposing my characteristic was something like this and this was let's say 0.6 volts, right? Effectively what we are saying is that this is now gone to 1.8 volts but this output is only at 0.6 volts. What will this be? It will correspond to some voltage that I have over here, right? But not only is it not likely to be a really low voltage, which is fine, more importantly, it's not even turning off the next stage NMOS transistor. Okay. Okay. So that is clearly a situation which is unacceptable. At least I want a situation where an input low voltage is low enough to turn off the NMOS and therefore get the output high. Okay. So one thing that we can clearly say is. I want the input low voltage to be lower than the threshold voltage of the next stage NMOS transistor, otherwise this stops even functioning. This is no longer even working as an inverter, right? So keep that in mind. In the CMOS, we never had such a situation. No matter what sizes of transistors you chose, the behavior always was the behavior of an inverter. Because for sufficiently high or sufficiently low input voltage, the output would go all the way to VDD or to ground. It would actually become a logic value. Okay? And the next stage would be appropriately turned off or on, as the case may be. Right? One of the transistors in the next stage would actually be turned off properly. Whereas over here, in some sense, even the functionality is failing. Okay? If I cannot even turn off the NMOS on the next stage, then clearly it is not working as an inverter at all. I mean, if I put two inverters one after the other, the output of the second inverter is not even a logic value. Okay? So, this kind of a circuit, in other words, it depends on, it actually depends on the sizes of the transistor as well as the resistor, even for its correct functioning. Okay? For the CMOS, we chose different sizes of the transistors, so that we could do something like balancing the rise times and fall times and so on, right? Or to change the value of the midpoint voltage, a few different things like that we can control by changing the sizes of the transistors, right? You can do that here also. But more importantly over here, if you do not choose them properly, even your functionality fails. Okay? 
So if the sizes are not chosen properly, the functionality of the system itself fails. Okay? Because of that, this kind of a circuit where we need to choose sizes of transistors and resistors carefully is called a ratio type of logic. Of course, it is difficult to talk about the ratio of sizes between an NMOS transistor and a resistor. They are after all two different kinds of elements. The ratio makes more sense when the load is not a resistor, it is something else which we will look at later. Right? But even now you can sort of think of it as ratio of the sizes, so to say. Right? So there is some size associated with the NMOS transistor, some size associated with the resistor. The ratio of those two is what determines whether this even works correctly. Okay? So this kind of a logic where you have a resistive pull up as the load is a ratioed logic. Static CMOS is not ratioed. It will work correctly no matter what sizes of transistors you choose. Right? It might work poorly in the sense that maybe if you have a high rise time versus a low fall time, right? Or the midpoint voltage might be very far away from VDD by 2, something of that sort. But the endpoints will still be correct. Whereas over here even the endpoint can fail. So, given all of that, one thing we can understand is the VOL desirable value is less than VT of the next stage. Okay? I am going to put some additional safety margin on top of that and say I want VOL equal to 0.1 volts because VT is typically 0.4. Right? So, let us just say VOL equal to 0.1 volts. That way I can make sure that not only is the next stage NMOS off, but the VGS is so much below VT that even the subthreshold current has been brought down significantly. Okay. So, let us see if I say that I want a VOL equal to 0 0.1 volts, how would I go about designing this system? Okay. So, what do I have? I have this resistance which I need to choose. I have an NMOS transistor which I will assume is of size 4 by 2 that is W equal to 4 lambda, L equal to 2 lambda. Okay. This is VL, this is VL. Right? write down the current balance equation that is whatever current is flowing through the resistor must then flow through the NMOS transistor under static conditions ok so ID is equal to in terms of R how much is ID VVD minus VO divided by R right In terms of the NMOS, how much is ID? First of all, which region of operation is it? Linear, right? So you put in the equation mu n C ox W by L into VDS into VGS minus VT minus VDS by Q. Okay, ignore channel length modulation and all of that. Okay. So let us plug in the numbers because after all I assumed that what I want is VDD is of course 1.8 volt. I want VO equal to 0 0.1. Okay. So plug in that value what I get is 1.7 divided by R is equal to mu n C ox for the NMOS is 180 microamps per volt square the number that we have been using so far into 4 by 2 into 0 0.1 into VGS. I am assuming that this is the on condition. So, VGS that is the VI is equal to VDD. Okay. So, VGS 1.8 minus 0 0.4 that which is VT minus 0 0.1 by 2. I am just going to neglect this for now in the computation. Okay. Simplify it. So, this is equal to 180 into 2 into 0 0.1 into 1.4. Okay. which means R is equal to 1.7 divided by 180 all this is microamps right into 0 0.28 okay. how much is this
Three point two or thirty? One by thirty what? Units, megawatts. So it's one by thirty megawatts, which is around thirty kilowatts. Okay. So, see, this is approximately point three. So this should come out to about six. So one by thirty, approximately, right? One by thirty megawatts because this was microamps in the denominator, which is around thirty kilowatts. So that's all. I mean, I don't care about the exact number. That you can do the calculations and find out. More importantly, the calculations were anyway done with a level one model, so they are not all that accurate, right? So keep that in mind. We are only trying to get a estimate over here, right? But it tells us that 30 kilo ohms is roughly the resistance that we should put over there to get a VOL somewhere in the region of 0.1 volts or so. Right? The calculation was very straightforward. It's easy to see how we can get that. Okay. So what does this mean? Right? Effectively, what it's telling you now is, yes, it is possible to build such a in uh, inverter. Right? The output voltage VOL will actually be pretty good. Right? I will see a 0.1 volts as the output voltage if I choose this value of the uh, resistance. Okay. So. Uh, once I have uh, chosen uh, this value of resistance, I will get this output voltage. Now, couple of questions that arise are, is this realistic? Can I actually build something like this and what impact will it have on other aspects of the design? Okay. So, first thing, can I build something of this sort? How do I get a 30 kilo ohm resistance on a silicon substrate when I am doing the design? Okay. So this becomes a question more for the technology, right? It is not so much something that the designer can say anything about. The technology has to make it possible for you to create a 30 kilo ohm resistor. Okay. Now you obviously cannot do it by putting a metal layer. The metal will have a very low resistance. Okay. So maybe some other kind of material that you put over there on the silicon surface could act as some kind of a fairly high resistance per unit length. So that by having a sufficiently long length, I might be able to find that I am actually get a 30 kilo ohm resistance. Okay. So what happens in such a situation is if I look at the layout, right? I have the VDD, I have the ground, I have the NMOS diffusion, right, which is connected to ground over here. I have the polysilicon across it, which is the gate. Now I have Normally, I would have connected this to the drain of the PMOS transistor. Now, what do I need to do? I need to connect it to the resistance. Okay, and that resistance, the other end of the resistance, goes to VDD. Okay, so typically, what happens is, on the sizes that we are talking about, right? Even if I take polysilicon or some material of that sort, its resistance is not that high that I can get 30 kilo ohms easily. So one way by which I can do it is I need to increase the length because resistance is going to be proportional to the length and inversely proportional to the width of the wire. Okay. So I choose a minimum width wire but still I need to make it longer. What can I do? I can probably do something like make it a very twisty shape of this sort. Right. So even in a relatively compact area, I can get a long wire which has a relatively large value for resistance. Okay. So it is possible, it is just that the layout will have to be done a little bit more carefully and it may not be as straightforward as in the case of a PMOS versus NMOS. PMOS was very easy to sort of implement over there. Right? It looked almost like the NMOS connectivity, everything was the same. Okay. So at least it is feasible. Right? So you can build something of this sort. Next question, right? What happens to the rise and fall time of this inverter? Okay, and is there something that I can do about it in order to control what the rise and fall times are going to be? Okay, so consider two cases. First, the fall time of the inverter, or let us consider first the rise time itself, that is probably a bit simpler.
okay so the output is going high the input has gone low output is going high what is the equivalent circuit at this point the nmos is off there is the r which is feeding into the external capacitance is there a parasitic capacitance associated with this for this kind of inverter does it have a parasitic capacitance yeah i mean the nmos is still there right the drain capacitance of the nmos is still around nothing has changed over there pmos is gone but the nmos is still there right will the wire have a parasitic capacitance associated with it it might for the time being i'm leaving that out of the picture right but for a more accurate calculation you need to find out how much is the parasitic associated with the wire also okay or the resistance okay so anyway leave out the parasitic for now the main thing that we need to uh, concern ourselves with is this is the charging circuit right this is how the current is going when we are actually trying to charge the output of the uh, inverter okay what about the fall time falling transition what i have over here is input is going high output is going low okay the nmos is acting like a pull down but the r is still pretty much there it hasn't gone out okay and there is a cl associated with it okay so whatever current is coming here right has to flow through the rn and go to ground right but in addition to that as the voltage at this point vo changes the amount of current flowing through r will also change okay as the vo decreases the amount of current flowing through r will actually start increasing initially there won't be any current flowing through r because vo is equal to vdd so the full current that the nmos can drain is essentially going to be just discharging the capacitors okay but after some time some amount of current that flows in through the r will also end up going into the nmos transistor and do sort of lose the effectiveness of the nmos partially okay but that's a sort of second order effect as a first cut we may still be able to take it that the nmos itself is just discharging the output load okay so now if i consider that as the case right i ignore this what is the equivalent rn that we considered so far what was the typical value that we found we did some computations right where we found rc and 3rc and all of those things what was the value of r that we chose huh was it 5 kilo ohms or right around 5 kilo ohms okay so what we are saying is rn is approximately around 5 kilo ohms it may be a bit more maybe 10 doesn't matter right the point is it's around 5 that range okay which means that the falling time is essentially going to be given by the time constant 5 kilo ohms times the c ci what about the rising transition this is 30 kilo ohms okay so the rising resistance the equivalent resistance for the rising transition is now much higher than for the falling transition okay at least under this set of choices that i made i chose the value of r based on one requirement which was that my vol should be 0.1 volts okay based on that i ended up with this value saying that r should be around 30 kilo ohms okay which is much higher than the equivalent pull down resistance of the nmos transistor which means effectively that as far as this inverter is concerned the falling transitions are going to be significantly faster than the rising transitions okay if you look at the waveform that you are going to see in something like this you will effectively say something of this sort the rising transitions will take a long time the falling transitions will be much faster rising transitions will take long falling transitions will be much faster than so okay so it will have a sort of skewed behavior right 
is there anything you can do about it what could you do about this how do you prevent this sort of skew or the disparity between rising and falling from becoming so large huh add another resistance in parallel to n1 okay so how does that help so one thing you could do is probably you have r over here what you are saying is add another r over here before the n mos right so this is just purely for the i'll call it r prime right this is purely to sort of balance the two resistances right is it helping not really what it's ending up doing is that it's making your fall time also slower right it's making the fall time worse right so what we have over here is you are ending up making your fall time worse you can make your fall time and rise time equal is that necessarily solving your problem not really you don't want to get a bad performance otherwise why would you go around doing all these optimizations okay it might help if your only goal was to get equal rise and fall times right on top of that i mean you also have the situation that okay the effective equivalent resistance from vdd to ground in the on state is now uh, increase but yeah that may may not be a bad thing okay what's the other alternative that you have ha huh? on vo correct right so this solution would increase the fault time the other possibility is i choose it in such a way that i say what if i say vo is equal to 0.2 volts instead of 0.1 what would i get if i go back to that i would see that 1.6 divided by r should be equal to 180 into 2 into 0.2 into 1.3 in this case okay which means that r would be equal to effectively what we will end up with is because this is 0.2 instead of the 0.1 that we had in the previous case you would end up with a much smaller value of the r right maybe closer to 15k or so right so now it becomes a trade off i can sort of say i will allow the effective output voltage output low voltage right instead of taking it all the way down to 0.1 i will allow it to go up to 0.2 alone Okay, that's slightly better for me. Okay, better in what sense? My rise time is now going to be better. Okay, what's the drawback? What's the problem with something like this? Huh? Your noise margins have reduced in some sense, right? Effectively, your output low voltage is only 0.2 instead of 0.1. So the amount of noise that you can tolerate on the low side has reduced. that's number 1 right second is what about sub threshold leakage for the next stage it increases why because when they supposing i have two uh, two inverters like this right if the output voltage here is 0.2 right effectively this nmos sees vgs minus vt is only equal to minus 0.2 volts right what does that mean in terms of the sub threshold current it means that it has come down by maybe two orders of magnitude rather than four orders of magnitude so instead of being in the pico amps range it is now in the nano amps range okay if you have thousands of such inverters that can essentially add up and give you a fairly large amount of leakage also okay so from the point of view of leakage current as well there is an issue over here you don't really want such a situation to happen okay now the final thing as far as this particular inverter configuration is concerned 
what happens when vi is equal to 0 the output is equal to vdt right is there any current flowing through the circuit at that point when the output is vdt static right it has reached vdt it is static there is no like transition going on over here is there any current flowing through the circuit be clear about this yes or no there are only two choices no ok so what about the other case when vi is equal to vdt so when vi is equal to vdt vi let us say is equal to 0.2 volts right the current id is equal to vdt minus vo by r that is also equal to mu n c ox etc because that is how we did the computation but this is a slightly easier thing to calculate right is equal to how much 1.8 minus 0 0.2 volts divided by in this case it was 15 kilo ohms right which is how much right this is approximately 0 0.1 milliamps or 100 microamps now given what you know about currents that flow through the transistors normally in this case is this a significant current or not it is a fairly large amount right it is close to the on current that you would actually see in the case of a transistor right the on currents might be 200 300 microamps 100 is not a negligible quantity now what is happening here what we are saying is as long as vi is equal to vdd this current is going to flow where is it flowing from the supply through the resistance through the nmos transistor to ground okay it is a constant source of power being dissipated okay so what we end up having is there is a constant power equal to vdd times id which is 1.8 into 0 0.1 milliamps is equal to around 0 0.2 milliwatts okay from each inverter if you have thousands of these this can be a very large quantity okay so in other words the big problem which was not there in the case of static CMOS is the fact that there is static power dissipation when vi is equal to vdt ok so why did we even come up with this design why did we even look at this as an option we essentially said look we do not want to have the situation which is there in static CMOS where I am putting in n NMOS transistors and another n PMOS transistors those PMOS transistors on top of that have lower mobility so they typically need to be larger for a given functionality ok which means that the area that they are going to occupy overall can be fairly significant for an inverter ok it is not a big deal but the moment I make slightly more complex circuits the area occupied by the PMOS part may be fairly big ok this said I will concentrate only on the pull down right the pull up part is taken care of by a single resistance ok now it is literally a single resistance for example how would you create a 2 input NAND gate using this how many resistors do you need still only one there is only one pull up ok so a 2 input NAND gate would look like this I have the resistance and I have two they should be in series this is what a 2 input 9 gate looks like what about a 2 input NOR gate that would have the 2 NMOS in parallel how would you choose the size of that R once again it has to be based on the relative sizes of the other transistors and so on 
the one simple thing that you could do is use the same kind of considerations you did for the CMOS inverter, right? If I make these two of size 2, right, that is W is equal to 8 lambda, right, or in this case, I make them of size 1, right, once again I have a worst case situation which looks like an inverter, therefore whatever R I chose for the inverter, I can put the same value over here as well and get a similar value for the VON. So the sizing considerations for the NMOS transistors that you have remain pretty much the same as what you would have done in the case of static CMOS. Okay. Once again it has the situation where there is static power dissipation because any one of these inputs or you know any time the pull down is high or active, right? if the output voltage is supposed to be low, it means static current is going to flow from VDD to ground. Okay. The advantage over here of course is no matter how complex your pull down network is, your pull up is just one resistor. Okay, so for more complex gates, this might actually become meaningful and useful to use. Right? The problems, ratio, static power dissipation, unequal rise and fall times. Okay? All of those you have to live with, but depending on your kind of application, this may actually make sense. Okay. So now, having said all of this, we can take the same idea forward and say, so what is one of the problems with the resistor? It was the fact that laying out a resistor on silicon is somewhat complex. Right? Actually building a resistor on a silicon substrate is not what it is normally meant to do. Right? Of course, you do it regularly all the time in analog circuit design, but then Analog circuits are typically much larger than digital where your whole goal in a digital circuit is to get to the smallest possible implementation. Okay? So if I have that constraint, can I do something else instead of that resistor? What else can I put as the load over there that would sort of behave the same way? What? What transistor? Right? The simple thing that you could do over there is let us consider something which looks like static CMOS itself, right? but as far as the PMOS is concerned, instead of connecting it to the input, let me leave this permanently grounded. Okay. What will happen here? In such a situation, what will happen is, once again, when input is low, Right? The NMOS is off, the PMOS is on. So this behaves exactly like the pull up for the static CMOS. Right? The PMOS takes care of pulling VO up to VDD. But when VO is equal to VDD, now there is a fight between the NMOS and the PMOS. Both are on. Right? The PMOS, the way it is connected, the gate terminal is permanently grounded. Okay? So it is always going to see a large value of VGS, channel is always formed, it is in a conducting state. Once VI becomes high, the NMOS also turns on. So both are in a conducting state, their relative resistances is what is going to determine the value of VO. Okay? Now it becomes Rn by Rn plus Rp times Vd. Okay? And same situation, you once again now need to choose Rp such that it is much greater than Rn so that your VO becomes sufficiently small. Which means I can no longer choose my PMOS like I did for static CMOS. Right? If I choose it of size 2, why did I choose it to be of size 2? So that the pull up and pull down resistances become equal. Right? and I get equal rise and fall time. But if I do that, then my VO will only become half VDD, which is going to be a terrible VO. Right? It definitely stops functioning. Right? This is yet another example of a ratioed logic. Right? Why am I calling it ratioed? Because even the functionality, the bare functionality of this, whether it behaves as an inverter or whether it behaves as a logic gate, 
depends on the relative sizes of the transistors not the rise time fall time and so on all of those also depend on the sizes but if it was only a question of rise time or midpoint voltage then i might say okay you know i can live with that but if it even stops working as an inverter then i have a problem that's what will happen in this case if i don't choose the ratios properly the thing will not even work as a inverter okay so once again this is a ratio of logic just like the resistive load and mos okay this type of logic is has a, speci a special name it's called pseudo and mos okay why the name pseudo and mos i'm not sure of the reason it's some <laughs> historical background associated with it right but pseudo and mos essentially consists of a situation where the pmos transistor is permanently on by having its gate grounded Okay. The NMOS transistors are chosen in such a way that they implement whatever pull down functionality is needed. Okay. How would you go about choosing the size of this? Finally, you would need to write down, you know, once again, you know what output voltage you want. Okay. To calculate VOL, right? If this is supposed to be low, which region of operation will the NMOS be in? linear same as last time right the vds is small what about the pmos what is the vds that the pmos sees vdd minus vo minus vo right so vdd minus vo when i am looking at vo should be a large quantity right i want it to be as close to vdd as possible right i want vo to be as small as possible so if vds the magnitude of vds across the pmos is large right so what are the three quantities the vds is large the vgs is large because gate is grounded vd sat is the third one most likely the smallest is going to be vd sat it will be velocity saturated okay so write down the corresponding current balance equations so what will you have you will have mu p c ox wp by l L is the same. I'll assume that once again this is kept as a minimum length transistor. Okay. V D sat of the PMOS into V G S of the PMOS minus V T PMOS minus V D sat by two. All this must be equal to mu n C ox W n by L into in this case V O L, right? Into VGS of the NMOS minus VT NMOS minus VO by two. Okay. Once again, if I sort of simplify this, right? L and L cancel. Mu P C ox is half of mu N C ox. Okay. The mobility in the case of holes is roughly half of electrons. and you can from this right given whatever you have for whatever target you have for vo 0.1 or 0.2 volts right you plug that value in and you can get the value of wp by wn okay where once again typically what we'll do is choose wn to be minimum size for lambda and then see what the wp should be okay but if you do that of course it may not work right what will happen in such a situation is you might end up with a situation where you want wp to be less than 2 lambda for example you want wp to be smaller right so that it has a higher resistance okay wp is definitely not supposed to be 8 lambda can wp be 4 lambda that slightly better is that good enough for the vo that you want i don't know you'll have to do the calculations you might end up in a situation or you know let's just put in the numbers over here right assuming that vd sat of the pmos is around 0.6 i think 
this should be roughly around 2 or so so this should come out to be around 0.4 or 0.5 Okay. So, what does that mean? That if Wn equal to 4 lambda implies that Wp should be around 2 lambda. Okay. Is this possible? Maybe. I mean you might be able to get a layout with Wp equal to 2 lambda. Otherwise, what it is telling you is you cannot choose Wn equal to 4 lambda. Wn at least has to be 8 lambda and everything else has to be in multiples of that. Okay. So, that your Wp minimum size can be 4 lambda. But this is roughly what we have over here. WP by WN should be around 0.4 or 0.5, somewhere in that region. Okay. So you can get, in other words, an approximate value for this, which once again satisfies your constraints in terms of VOL. Right? Based on the value of VOL, you will now find that rest of the behavior, you know, analysis is very similar to what you had in the case of NMOS. Right? Once again, the rising and falling transitions will be different. The current that you have in the two cases will be different. Right? So, the rising time will typically be longer than the falling time because you have to choose the WP in such a way. Right? Will that be static power dissipation? Yes. yes. Right? Same as before. When, when VI is equal to VDD, VO becomes equal to whatever 0.1 or 0.2, but that means there is a static current through the PMOS which then drains through the NMOS. Okay? So, once again there is static power dissipation, once again it is ratioed, right? once again the rise and fall times may not be equal depending on the choices that you have. Okay? But in this case especially what you end up with is a situation where especially if we consider something like NOR gates, okay? let us consider NAND gates versus NOR gates in this technology. What I have is a single PMOS. like this and in the case of the NOR gate what I have is, so typically this would be a size 2 each <coughs> 1 each ok. What happens if I go for a 3 input NOR gate versus 3 input NAND gate? The NAND will have 3 NMOS in stack right stack one on top of the other. NOR gate will have just have 3 in parallel. 4, 4 in parallel. right? So, NOR gates in other words, it suddenly looks like they are very attractive in this kind of technology. right? I have the entire problem of the PMOS stack has been <laughs> got rid of by having just one PMOS transistor. Okay? And the NMOS pull down is essentially a series, you know, a whole bunch of them sitting in parallel. All of them can be of minimum size and give you the correct functionality. Okay? So, it turns out that especially when you want to do sort of NOR rich circuits, this kind of implementation is potentially very useful. right? And one place where that finds application is in a situation where we are actually looking at certain kinds of non-volatile memory elements. right? So, you may have heard of the terms NAND flash and NOR flash, right? the flash memory technology. Okay? Apart from flash memory, in general in many types of read only memory kind of applications, they are built using some kinds of complex NAND or NOR gate structures. Right? And it turns out that because of this, things where you require large numbers of parallel NOR gates can be done very efficiently using this pseudo NMOS kind of implementation. Okay? So, from that point of view, this can be useful in those kind of circuits. In general, it has all these problems of static power and so on. But there can be situations where it actually becomes the preferred way of implementing something. Okay. All right. We'll stop here for now. Continue.